Echelon, admitted by an ex-CIA director, James Woolsey, in uh, 2000, we steal secrets with communications and reconnaissance satellites. This all falls in the context of what we now call the Five Eyes, and those old hands used to call Yakuza, the United States, uh, UK, United Kingdom Agreement, forged just after the Second World War with a design to spy on the entire planet. And boy, did they achieve that goal. These days, as we now know, and from many documents, it's called the Five Eyes. My early acquaintance with this, and yes, this is an early version of me, and yes, that is the beginning of Echelon, as you'll see, was back in 1976 when I put together the article that revealed the existence of GCHQ for the first time and what it did. Uh, publicly, not much happened, but in private, they were furious and they resolved to go after me and GCHQ in particular. Their modern mission, as we know, mastering the internet. Let's see how they got there. The eavesdroppers article of 1976 consisted of information from American sources who weren't, as now, covered by the United States, uh, British laws, sorry, and at its heart, a map of all the listening stations around Britain, which the people inside government thought came from a dead secret source, but actually was me on a bicycle in the telephone directory. They were not pleased with us, and as a result of their uh, displeasure, eight months later, with a former soldier and other journalist, we were arrested, put on trial, and they made a transcript of what we'd said, and as you can see, they didn't want just to write secret on it once, they wrote it three times. And they were quite determined to bring a stop to everything that tried to do. They wanted a stop right there and then to investigation, and particularly into this area. They didn't just charge me under the strange, curious British law of the time uh, of uh, uh, getting inf official information, which was a crime in Britain, but they added espionage charges with the result that by the end of it, and by the time the story could be told, I was facing 30 years imprisonment and two counts of espionage. The case fell apart, the story is being told, it's been told again. So in this country, GCHQ was secret until 1976. We got it out then, and in 1980, got out another story about one of the largest, well, in fact, the largest NSA field station in the planet, built in Britain and at the heart of Britain's international communications. Now, revisiting this story has been quite a sensation for us because with the reporter who did it, we've realized that there's an untold story of how come that massive investigation, which was commissioned <laughs> by the Sunday Times newspaper, never got out. And we flushed out what we think the real way that that story was blocked. But the Sunday Times put massive amounts of work. Linda Melvin, who was the journalist, called some fantastic sources, including one top NSAP person. He told us to go and look for the cables that connected Menwith Hill to the British phone system. And Linda went up there with a the photographer lifted the lid, and there they were. But even back then, even in these dark days, just after coming out of prosecution, we had fantastic sources in the United States giving information and pointing to the early days of mass surveillance. Instead of going in the big British newspaper, it ran in my then left-leaning magazine, The New Statesman, the billion-dollar phone tap. And like quite a lot of other stories, until the modern era, it got forgotten. But at the time, we reported that the post office, now British Telecom, had built uh, Menwith Hill into the heart of British telecommunications, a wall that they dishonorably continue today, according to masses of stuff in Snowden's documents, under the code name or cover name of Remedy. And what was this used for? We'll come back to this. This was built in the 1970s, like Echelon, which we're just about to come to. It was started in the days before the Church Commission that was referred to, before Watergate, before Nixon, before all those events that temporarily brought the US system out to surveillance. And they targeted Americans and the West, just as resolutely as they targeted everybody else. And this is a quotation from a top secret Justice Department report, which named the fact that GCHQ was also involved in spying on targeted Americans under programs of the uh, directed against protest movements and civil rights leaders, unlawfully it was judged by attorneys looking at it. 
Memory still station, field station F83 um, is uh, still there and going very large. And these people just walking down the thing, they're part of a one bunch of wonderful women who have maintained an almost continuous protest over 20 years there. And on one fantastic occasion, spending a year collecting NSA's garbage in order to sift it for documents that became so powerful we could make a program about it. Uh, one slide, and I'm just going to mention it because it is in the narrative. I had a program on a GCHQ spy satellite banned in 1987. It was made for the BBC, but then blocked for publication. But as a result of that, um, Lowell Bergman invited me to California to come and celebrate the 10th anniversary of their center out there for investigative reporting. And uh, as a result of that trip, which I took extended, I came to meet another American ex-NSA whistleblower, Margaret Newsham. And Margaret told me all about Echelon. And that's where our story begins. 1988, Southern California. She was a whistleblower, another one in that honorable tradition. She'd worked in Silicon Valley and she'd worked at Men with Hill Station. And she had become concerned about corruption. She'd witnessed from Men with Hill the spying on American citizens. Uh, she wanted to keep a lot of her, uh, she wanted to keep a lot of her uh, personal involvement in giving me documents secret at the time, so the story doesn't say that. But 12 years later, um, with a big investigation underway, she said, say that I'm the source, just as like Mr. Snowden did. And in fact, by putting together what Margaret Newsham provided and what we can see now in Edward Snowden's papers, the big whole story comes out. And uh, the way we told it, uh, and by we, I particularly mean me, Nikki Hager from New Zealand, and James, we got it right. But let me take you back to the 1960s, because this is where this comes from. And if you can set your mind back in history, you may understand the extraordinary context of why this is so important, and why it's fundamental, because it was the first automated mass surveillance system. As people have said before, and will say after, They'd been listening to radio signals from the early years of the 20th century. It became industrial and effective in the Second World War, but they never, ever stopped. 1961, Berlin. 62, the Cuba blockade, the, Russia, uh, the missile crisis. 63, John Kennedy assassinated. 64, the Russians are arming big time. The nuclear miss missile race is on. And for those of us who lived through years to years, we were scared and scared as shit. Soviet missiles, like American missiles, proved an existential threat to all of us, societies, and the planet. Who's not to be worried about that? But what they worried about wasn't the Soviet missiles, or at least half of the time. They worried about this other thing on the right there. That's the first international communication satellite, Intelsat, designed in 1965. Same year as many, many tests going on. And yet, when it came to the business, they were equally interested in <coughs> Soviet satellites and spying on the West. So the Zirkin project began in 1966. It was founded at exactly the same time as they founded a program to spy on Soviet satellites. That is the extraordinary thing. The reality of the threats of the Cold War are not to be denied and are not by forgotten by those who were there. But the priority NSA gave to spying on its own citizens, because who was going to be the major communica communicators on those Western satellites? The people and companies of the United States and the small, just then, 11 countries that were going to be linked together by that first satellite. They founded the Echelon program, and they wanted it done, and they wanted it done from Britain, even in those days before they'd been caught out on their illegality. And in the consequence, they selected a site, now notorious, it's still probably the epicenter of planetary mass surveillance, although that may change. It's in the English county of Cornwall in the southwest, uh, near a seaside and surfing town called Bude. They had to build massive antennae to collect the signals. They needed to build the same very large antennae 
that the communications companies were putting in place um, to communicate. So on the left here, you see a terminal in Andover, Maine in the United States, which was the legitimate terminal to communicate. And the British, with American money, paid for by NSA, the kit was paid for by NSA, put in a terminal that was going to pick up all those signals and feed them into GCHQ's NSA spying system. And by the way, we're only in 1970 now. This is a 50-year-old history, not a history of the Internet. These are the two terminals that were built at the time. This is yours truly, who didn't know where, what he was running outside in 1977, but some, uh, somebody took the picture and we found it recently. These two terminals, and we have to thank James for this, because he found a marvelous letter in uh, an archive of a former NSA director, which said that he had leaned shamefully to get the British Treasury to pay just to run this station. American money, under the Echelon Agreement, paid for the equipment. But the British had to run it, and he had to go to the Treasury. And he bullied them by using the influence of the United States. So this was driven, at the height of the Cold War, a project of equal priority to spy on the United Kingdom, United States, and Western Europe, had equal priority to the priority of spying on Soviet satellites to see off a nuclear war. The British were, no doubt, willingly persuaded then as now, to build the thing and put it in place. And so Echelon started with the UK. New stations were added at other locations as the satellite constellation expanded, and we will see just how much it expanded. But I remind you again, think of the year. We're in 1970. Nixon hasn't just got into power and he hasn't bugged Watergate. The Congress hasn't turned on him, he hasn't gone from power. America has driven Britain into getting the same priority on spying on Western communications and at massive cost started the Echelon system to do it. New Echelon stations came after that. We have, for example, it's one in Northwest, uh, Northwest America in the state of Washington and another one down in Virginia, hidden in forests, gradually adding to the system. Later on, the Australians were to be persuaded to add two stations. Uh, a station was built in Japan, very big one, still going now, and viewed itself with the cover name of Carboy, it's a fairly recent picture, has massively expanded. The Echelon 2 upgrade, which Margaret Newsham, the whistleblower, provided information about, was put in place during the 1980s, and Echelon 2 came in, Carboy 2 was the new installation that viewed. The key thing about Echelon, this is in James's writing, my writings, Nikki's writings, but don't trust all of the other stuff you read about Echelon because so many people turned it into the panopticon that does everything. It's a very specific project with a very specific purpose, horrific, global in scale, but it doesn't access television cameras. It, it doesn't uh, sneak into your house. It doesn't do a lot of things that you may see in some of the looser articles. It intercepts communication satellites, not military satellites, but the communication satellites. For many years, our own satellites, because the Russians and the Chinese weren't and couldn't use those satellites. It brought in the first automatic processing, the stuff that is now at massive scale, as described in so many documents, out already more coming from the Snowden archive. They used computers to do it. So everything had to be taken into computers, uh, sorted according to lists of terms that were selected, and then that information that was garnered forwarded, mostly in written communications, telex, telegraph type signals. And then in the transition of the 80s and 90s, those started being computers talking to each other. NSA called this for a while C2C, computer to computer communications. Echelon covered that, of course. And this was the kind of equipment that Margaret Newsham's company, Lockheed, put together to install in Menwith Hill, uh, in uh, Bude, and in other locations around the world at US government expense. Get the Allies to provide the land and the people, but America paying for it. Then we come to the middle of the 1990s. This is New Zealand station at Waihopai in South Island. Um, this is the book that got Echelon going. Um, 
Nikki Hager did a lot of work, I think I'm right to say, utilizing the fact that in a small country, social relationships are easier to generate, <laughs> and laid out, uh, and confirmed the story for those who were ready to believe us, and laid out the tapestry of how it worked, including the pivotal computer at the center, which was called the dictionary. And the dictionary spread around the world as a program on a single interception network. So within the echelon system, you had the dictionary system of coordinated surveillance from all the satellites through all the ground stations, all the beams feeding in. The template for what we now see on a scale, I, can't, I don't know how many knots, nine, a billion times larger, a thousand billion times larger, at scale beyond goal comprehension. Because of that, and perhaps by happenstance, people in Europe, although nowhere else, started paying attention. And reports were done in the European Parliament starting in 1998, and then they turned to me and said, write it all up. And this report was what I prepared in 1999 for 2000, setting out the whole tapestry of what Echelon was, what it meant, and what was coming next. And that report was handed to the Parliament in August, and a uh, debate took place on many, many resolutions to uh, control mass surveillance and spying on international communications. The European Parliament passed all of those resolutions on the 5th of September, 2001. We know what happened next. And that was moved to be exploited with ruthless speed by people who didn't give a damn about the scale of carnage in Washington or New York but knew where, the opportunity was, uh, knew where the opportunity was to do what they dreamed. And yes, I'm talking about you, Dick Cheney, because more than anything else, he is probably the architect of what was what next. At the time, NSA was preparing for the internet age. These are some declassified reports I got in the mid noughties of the transition to digital network intelligence. They're, they're written before 2001. They are the plan for tapping the internet. Now, in one of these most extraordinary developments, the person who basically wrote this report is now my friend, a whistleblower. His name is Bill Binney, and he was the person running the SIGM Automation Research Center. He shared the shock of the attacks on America, of fleeing from NSA's headquarters. And yet, just days later, with others who've now also walked from the agency, he saw what Cheney had orchestrated and put in place before even the president had put his signature on the top secret program that's taken more than a decade to outline. Stella Wynn was underway before the president even authorized the surveillance project. And Bill and the others remember the, corridor, the room at the end of their corridor in one of NSA's blocks, which was targeting the Soviet Union's high command, being cleared out and the corridors filling with racks of Dell servers which were there to spy on the American people. We've been here before. We were here in the 1960s and there it was. And now we can see it not just through the lens of Edward Snowden, but so many courageous people who more than a decade before came out of NSA to talk about it. Echelon has continued, of course, and grown to scale. This is one of the early Snowden slides. They now call it Fornsat, Fornsat collection. These are all the old echelon stations. You can just see Carboy, that's Bude. You can see Moon Benny, that's Menwith Hill. You can see Jackknife, that's the one in Washington. Timberline, that's the one in West Virginia. And then there were new stations. Britain had built one in Oman. Australia and New Zealand had joined in, the one in Japan we've seen. So that is all consistent. That was the first of the material from uh, Edward Snowden that was confirming Echelon was just as we understood it. But his papers are going to reveal the scale in which this has become an international enterprise, far beyond just the simple five eyes. All sorts of countries have been co-opted massively into this single systematic, systematic automated system. Denmark, for example, paid for by NSA, as usual. Spain has a ground station. You don't often hear about them or think they're significant. Sweden is hugely important. And again, they listen to the satellites and, of course, they tap the cables. This is the Snowden slide. It's not five eyes anymore. It's not the five English-speaking countries. It's 35 eyes. All part of a massive, global, integrated system with 
third parties playing a major role in just feeding in what NSA wants. So the countries have a point, they have embassy spy centers, they have malware systematically inserted into computers, 50,000 in one report, a million in another, and of course they tap the optical fiber cables. NSA also subverts the internet by subverting companies uh, and the hardware and the software and the crypto systems, and this story is just starting to pour out. But it matters, not just to our privacy, but corporations like Cisco and Juniper who the world has now learned have their products compromised both without and without the will have seen their stock collapse. That is the significance of putting spying ahead of people and commerce. In total, five countries, 30 partners, 90 commercial partners, this is all data from Snowden Slides, 20 major cable accesses, 20 more covert cable accesses, 100 embassy interception sites, and the millions of computers that are uh, infected with NSA malware. And again, the malware detection companies have been seeing this for years and keeping quiet. And so we come to the new meme that Snowden has brought us to us, that even in the face of this massively expanding empire of surveillance, they want to collect it all, quote unquote. That is also true of the Echelon program. This, remarkably, is not an echelon station, it's a satellite TV station in Los Angeles downtown, but I wanted to show it to you because it shows how Echelon 2 is responding to NSA's demand, which seems to be being implemented, to collect it all. This is a new kind of antenna here. It's called a torus, and there's a close-up of it, and because of its design and the stuff around the bottom, it can spy on 20 satellites at once. <laughs> and over the last few years, they've been creeping in at all the echelon stations in Britain, in America, at Fort Meade itself, out in the Gulf, in Oman, and uh, elsewhere. So the collected all mission is expanding. Echelon is growing. In fact, possibly in a cheeky um, act of respect to those of us who are authors, the official language of an NSA to its partners is that they should cover up their fiber to cable tapping operations by tapping fibers from the same place as they do the satellites. Because we can all see the satellites, that's how we found the stations, that's how we wrote about them. So the actual project is, you bring the cables in there because they won't notice there's something new. And that's what's happened at Bude. Most of the Atlantic cables are tapped to Bude and fed into now, as we know, temporary storage that can hold up to 30 days of internet for, for traffic analysis, the so-called Tempora project. The cables land, they're clandestinely accessed to places like this, processed to a degree, and then fed up to Cheltenham or to Bude, pumped over to America. Complete access is their goal. They don't have it yet. They just take what they can with their probes. But the greed to take all our data is knows no end. But it never had. You saw it in the 60s, you see it in the 80s, and you see it now in the 21st century. Going to Oman, this is um, Sieb, Britain's uh, echelon site in the north. It's been going for 10 or 15 years. It's one of the major echelon sites, and uh, its secondary role is that it's the secret third base in GCHQ's Tempora interception system with massive access to all of the cables in the Gulf. The Guardian were deterred from publication by the appalling pressure that was brought to bear on them after the fantastic first wave of revelations. So it took about nine months to get the story of this place. Its code name is Circuit, and uh, it's uh, located in the Gulf and feeding straight back into the British system. It's important to know that when GCHQ and NSA talk about going dark because of what we do, it's not the truth. It's going dark because the traffic is moving around to places like Mumbai and Singapore. But despite that, they boast in this topic with side that they create 50 billion events per day. So, that's Echelon. <laughs>